Caddis Maximus here again, this time with a quick review of the MW122A. This is a small, regulated DC power supply. What this little thing is designed for, and I find it quite handy, is to do testing when you need batteries for something. Essentially, it's a plug-in replacement power unit that allows you to use various clip wires, which I'll show in a second, to test out devices or even just run devices that normally use batteries and that's uh, what makes this thing really handy it works well it has excellent elect electricity or excuse me very low noise electricity that's because it's a linear transistor regulated power supply I'll also explain that in a minute but it's just designed to replace common uh, incremental cells such as 9 volt batteries or standard 1.5 volt batteries whether those are nickel metal hydrides rechargeables or just alkaline batteries disposables so you'd have 3 volts for 2 batteries 4.5 volts for 3 batteries 6 volts for either 6 volt cell items or uh, when they use 4 1.5 volt batteries a 7.5 volt which I actually have seen every once in a while devices that use 5 batteries a uh, 9 volt, which would also be 6 bat individual batteries or just the normal 9 volt cells. And of course, 12 volt. Now, 12 volt is obviously a very common voltage for all sorts of electronics from your internet router to, you know, all the automobiles. Only the newest, more high-end, really uh, electrified automobiles are moving to higher voltage systems. Uh, but that is the universal voltage, it seems, is 12 volts. And the easiest way to describe how a power supply like this differs from what, say, is inside your computer or a little uh, charging brick is it's very heavy because it has a traditional iron transformer in it. Some larger wall wart style uh, power bricks, you can feel their heft, meaning that they have a, a transformer in them. And they put out much cleaner power than what is known as an electronic switching power supply, which are the power supplies that have all sorts of circuits. The big deal is, is a switching power supply puts out tons of electrical noise. Sometimes it can be 50 to 100 times. It's really that much of a difference. So electronics that run on batteries, batteries themselves put out virtually zero noise. They're almost perfect in that respect. And so when you're using a testing device, um, especially for lower voltage battery operated items. When you get to 12 volts, there's a variety of high power power supplies you can get if you need to use you know, high power items for testing automobile motors and you know, power window racks, that kind of stuff. But on all the other little devices, uh, it's a big deal that they have very quiet, well-regulated power. So a switching power supply could have hundreds of millivolts of noise or something like this might have point you know, 3 to 5 millivolts. So the difference between 0 0.2, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 or 0.002 or 0 0.005. So big difference. And that way you won't have any unexpected behavior from any, elect especially digital electronics that use uh, replaceable batteries. And how these are built is they do. They have a heavy transformer and they have a transistor which actually regulates a specific voltage and then you have a nice detent here. And what I actually don't remember is whether you can go in between values or whether this will, um, with this switch, or if it's actually switching physical contacts inside. But I'll take a look inside so you can see how it's built. The best way to describe how these are built is like an audio amplifier for home. You have a big transformer which isolates it from electrical noise from your power system because it's two coils that are close to each other but aren't physically connected. And then a transistor to really smooth out any ripples that are occurring. But these do heat up when you're using lots of load. They're not efficient at all. You know, the maximum output, since this will only put out 2 amps, it will put out 2 amps irrespective of what voltage, which is uh, a kind of a weird thing. You think maybe I go down lower in voltage, it could put out more amperage. But the nature of the way these linear uh, power supplies are designed, uh, they're kind of like a class A transform or amplifier. So they can, they're a little bit different. They can always put out two amps regardless of their voltage. So it could put out 24 watts if you're up at the 12 volt setting, but only six watts if you're at the three volt setting. All these are actually fuse protected, but the way they also work is if you overload them, they'll just continue to drive it. And of course in electronics, you'll drop voltage when something's overloaded, but that's the other nice aspect of these is they won't shut down. 
Uh, if you overload it, it'll just sit there and be overloaded uh, and only outputting its maximum power. So if it's on a three volt setting, it would only be able to put out a maximum of six watts of power, whether or not you just had a piece of wire connecting both these terminals or made some kind of mistake. So it's kind of nice that way. And so the fuse on the back is in case there's some kind of internal damage, uh, you know, for fire safety. The deal with these is, is all the power that's going through it actually is regulated by the transistor, so they tend to get pretty hot under use. Uh, like on this unit, they don't have heat sinks, but it is, uh, the transistor is screwed to an aluminum plate which acts as the heat sink. And let me zoom out a little bit here. This would be just a step down from what would be considered a more serious uh, regulated DC power supply. This is a uh, BK Precision. This is what is known as an electronic test uh, power supply. The standard on these is up to 3 amps and variable from 0 to 30 volts. There's all sorts of different units, but what would be considered the standard, and if you ever found one used somewhere, most likely that's what it would be. It would be a, even an old analog one. It would be 3 amps, variable up to 30 volts. Of course, these are more substantial. That you know, this these type are either fan cooled or they have giant heat sinks on them. Uh, they're a more serious unit, and so of course you can manually adjust this to any voltage. This little guy does. This is just makes it convenient because you can click in, and it's a lot cheaper than getting one of these. Let me get this out of the way. Anyway, continuing here. So how you might use this unit? I actually have some Pomona wires here. We'll talk about those, and uh, and I'll do a whole review of those by themselves. But kind of handy terminals. Uh, I put together some uh, just using some high quality wire I got from some kind of electronics I took apart. You can of course buy commercially made cables that are essentially the same thing. Now one thing to mention on these units, and this is pretty standard among all different power supplies, is that you have screw terminals. Uh, basically what's on the back of any high quality speaker, that's the easiest way to say it. it's the same kind of terminals. They're screw down so you can use forks. They, if we can even see, do these not? Most times they have holes in them as well. This particular set of terminals on here does not, but you can always upgrade that. And they take what is known as banana plugs. So the little holes are approximately 3 16 And so all the, what are known as banana plugs, the easy plug in and out uh, wires for audio equipment for speaker terminals, is the same thing that electronics power supplies and even multimeters the sockets are all the same size it's actually a nice standard so we have an electronic supply and so I was able to pick up some you know do-it-yourself screw together banana plugs nice little gold plated ones they even had these special boots which fit over them and I had two different sets of cables one set I have is these little hook clips where you can hook them onto a spring or something and it makes it kinda nice for uh, applying power to certain types of battery terminals such as when you might have a spring or something. They're really nice and solid when you hook onto those. Additionally, you can get another set of wires such as these. Same kind of banana clip thing, uh, but just little alligator clips. And I did solder these. You always want to try to solder. And then these are gold-plated, these banana clips, and they really crunch the wires. So they're pretty good uh, as far as conductivity. And then that way, with just a couple sets of cables and a few dollars, uh, you can use this to plug in just about to any electronics that takes a reasonable number of cells. You're not going to, you know, power a classic 80s big boom box, and they're even making a comeback now, but they're all lithium powered. You know, they're not going to drive motors and allow you to test some high draw, you know, electric, remote control electric car. This wouldn't power the car, but if you were having issues with the actual remote itself, you could use this to power the remote. And if you're at your house, that would be a great idea because you could use this to power the remote and then you wouldn't have to worry about it uh, using up all the batteries. I'm just going to do a quick demonstration of it going through the voltages here. I have my little fluke meter. And uh, we have these Pomona cables. These are designed for these type of operations for hooking various electronic items up to uh, uh, power supplies and that kind of stuff. And I'll do a full review. But these things are really nice because you can plug them in. If you need to plug something else in, you can go crossways through there, or you can go through the back here, or you have this style cable which has an output in the front and the back. The kind of, the deal with these is you can plug two cables in the, whoop, not there. 
if you have multiples and you can plug two cables into each other and they have a real solid connection because they're double connected. Anyway. Holy mackerel, this one is tight. These Pomoda cables are sometimes too tight. Like any banana plug, some manufacturers uh, really muscle them in. So, uh, yes, on multimeters, you can you plug banana cables just straight into them. Uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that, but it's a handy feature of them. I should probably turn the supply on before we plug it into there. If I didn't have it backwards, that might help. There we go. So we have our, let me zoom in. That'll make it easier. Get that out of the reflection. So we've got 3 volts, 4.5. And it does, when you switch the switch, it instantaneously changes the voltage. This is a true RMS multimeter. So it uses a real simple uh, microprocessor to take a history of the voltage that's coming in and then create your true RMS voltage value. So if it takes a minute for it to say, oh, everything coming in is exactly 4.5 volt and for it to settle in. True RMS is accurate because lots of time there's electrical noise and other weird stuff that are traditional multimeter or a non-true RMS would show you wildly fluctuating readings. I, the, the same way as if you're going down a bumpy road, uh, uh, if you're just taking a snapshot of what the car is doing at any moment in time, you think that you're actually going up a hill and then you're going down a hill when it's just a bumpy road and it's actually t totally flat. That's exactly kind of what this does. Uh, or what true RMS does. Kind of acts like suspension. So anyway, as we switch to the voltages, and that's what's really nice about these linear power supplies is they're usually extremely accurate, precisely accurate. See how long it takes for it to Finally, you know, true RMS, it's a way to say, oh, it's really six volts. And then part of the reason it takes so long is because of how accurate this is. It did go really fast when I went to 7.5, 9 volts, and of course, 12 volts. So that's another aspect of these is you can always be confident that you're getting an exact voltage. I'm going to turn this back down to 4.5, and I'll demonstrate how it works here. If I can get that connector out of the thing. Holy moly. If anybody is in the audio equipment who watches my channel, they may know about Monster Cable, particularly their higher end, like 12 cut turbine connectors. Those are the audio cables that indeed did hold on tightly. Too bad they held on so tight and would hook and catch on that they were ripping plugs out of the back of audio equipment. And Monster Cable is kind of like Master Lock. They're an eclectic company. Let me get these wires set up. Alrighty, and that was a Fluke 375 that I was using. So I'd like to test out this LED flashlight. Say, you know, you don't have batteries. Maybe you think, oh, I mean, are all my batteries low? It's not very bright. Uh, you can test it with one of these supplies. Three batteries, so we'll be using 4.5 volts. We always know that the little... Uh, nipple on a bat on a round cell battery is the plus side, the positive. So we know this is the positive, and then this is going to be the negative. And they actually have a little electrical bar going down through there. And so it'd be easiest to use one of these little clip tools, just to clip onto that spring there, and that thing ain't falling off when I'm fiddling with it. Generally speaking, you'll uh, connect the positive. Uh, it'll be uh, last in and first out. So you hook everything up and then the last thing you do generally speaking and I forgot to mention you don't want to have something plugged into one of these right when you turn the power on uh, because there'll be like a little blip of noise uh, right when it's turning on and regulating itself so you'll want to turn it on and give it a second to uh, calm down and since we have a little gap right here we'll just use the alligator clip this one's really stiff for some reason we'll just stick that in there like that Okay, and do we know if the light works? We're not having good luck here. Apparently it was a connection issue. Let's see how bright this little thing is anyway. Mm, kind of a cheesy light, but it's good to use in the, in the car. I guess it's not so bad. But that's a great thing about it, and I can see that it's reasonable brightness, but I know exactly how bright it's going to be uh, when it has new batteries. And obviously I'm not chasing stuff around, and 
in a pinch you can have a battery powered light like this and run it off the power supply and I know I should have unplugged it from the power supply first I did make a mistake there Anyway, I was going to go ahead and open this up just so anybody could have a quick look inside and see how these things work. Let me take a, just some four Phillips head screws. I'll just take a second. Now, with electronics, half the time you actually leave them upside down and pull off the bottom plate. But kind of sensing what it is, like maybe audio equipment or power supplies, usually you have to remove the screws and then turn it back upright. Make sure the two plates don't get stuck into the top lid. Just some tips to open these up without having issues. And so it's just real simple what's inside one of these. We just have our transistor. It actually has the metal plate in the back and then two more layers. So that is an internal heat sink. They didn't do such a bad job on this unit. An outsized transformer. But this thing literally, since these are maximum 50% efficient, if this was running at 2 amps at 12 volts, putting out its, we'll just call it 25 watts, that transformer has to be sized to handle 50 watts. And since they're constant current, it needs to be able to do that continuously. And they will get hot when you do it. And a little bridge rectifier, which turns the AC signal that's alternating uh, to pulses of DC. And then this is one other property. So we can see the rotary switch just goes across some contact pads on a circuit board. So you can always spray something called deoxid in there. And there's a capacitor down in there. You probably see it better... Maybe right there, there's a can. That's what smooths out the pulses. And so this transformer, as we can see, has a whole bunch of wires coming off of it. So each time you switch the voltage, it's like switching to, it is, it's physically switching to what is known as a different winding. But it's like you're physically changing transformers out. So instead of having, you know, however many voltages, this has six different settings. Instead of having six different transformers, they have a more oversized transformer in addition to handling its full wattage. Uh, the transformer is a little more oversized and then they give, you, they give you what is known as multiple taps. So if you run this at obviously 6 watts, it may only just get lightly warm. Where if you're running it at 24 watts, it'll get pretty hot. And so this is all designed. It does have a series of resistors to where each time you switch that switch, this transformer is actually putting out all these different voltages. And even though it's six settings, you only see five wires, there actually is a six wire hiding way over off to the left. That would be the nominal 12 volt. And so that would be kind of like a direct connection. It doesn't, when you go through the switch, it's not really, you know, doing anything. That's, I'm not explaining that correctly, but it's routed just a little bit differently. So these things are kind of a little, they're both simple because they only have a few components inside them, just some resistors and something to rectify the AC signal, but they're actually really nice and really reliable. And I think you can find this thing online for like 20 or $30. And of course, you know, they're cheap, but they're not super cheap because you got a bunch of material, a big heavy chunk of iron, magnetic iron and copper wire and uh, having a transformer that's custom wound so it has all these different taps coming off of it. It does add a little bit to the price, but these things are actually really invaluable, especially if you're into working on any kind of little electronics projects or lighting things up with LEDs, etc. You don't have to use batteries. You can have a power supply that plugs in and will run as long as you need it to. Anyway, this has actually been a surprisingly handy tool in the workshop for various uh, operations. I've even run out of batteries on multimeters and run multimeters off of this, and they work great. And so it's kind of like a plug-in battery. Anyway, that's the end of uh, this review. And I really appreciate everybody watching and subscribing. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. Caddis Maximus out.